Mario, I'm usually really confident about everything we do, but today, man, I hope we didn't bite off more than we can chew. Oh boy. The ocean, a vast wilderness where life began millions upon millions of years ago. And to this day, remains one of the most unexplored environments on our planet. Within its depths live an abundance of mysterious creatures, many that often surpass even our wildest imaginations. And some of them have even emerged as the monstrous icons of our greatest fears. My name is Mark Vince. I am a filmmaker, adventurer, and director of the Brave Wilderness Channel. Together, through the lens of our cameras, you've joined me and the crew on countless journeys through the most extreme habitats on Earth. You have followed along as we've taken you closer to the world's most bizarre and misunderstood creatures than any film crew in history. And today, I am proud to say that it is those adventures that have led me to this moment to an opportunity I have dreamt about since childhood, the moment I begin my exploration of the Great Blue Wilderness. But this is no solo mission. I will be surrounded by familiar faces and some new ones as well. With Mario taking over as director, I will proudly step in front of the camera to lead a band of aquatic explorers on one of the most ambitious marine projects ever embarked upon. Because you see, You've been along since the very beginning. Yeah! There are no rehearsals on this stage. You've seen us become dive certified and even witnessed our very first dives in the open ocean. And the adventures to follow will not only test our bravery, but our commitment to the word adventure itself. And these expeditions start now. Because today, you will witness our very first shark encounter and there will be no cages. Welcome to Tiger Beach. Located off the coast of West End Grand Bahama, this location is not a beach at all, but rather a world famous destination for shark diving. More specifically, tiger shark diving. What makes this dive site so special are the powdery white sand bottoms, the beaches, if you will, that reflect brilliant ambient light through warm, crystal clear tropical water, creating a very special shark diving experience that is world class and second to none. And not only will you see tiger sharks, you can encounter up to five different species, all formidable, all top marine predators, all on the same dive. To say we were starting out our shark diving adventures in a big way might be a bit of an understatement. And with this being such a landmark moment for Mario and I, we simply couldn't imagine doing this adventure without inviting along someone very special. All right, guys, here we are. Big day. We're about to head offshore to swim with tiger sharks. This is going to be so crazy. And I think you guys know we couldn't do this without our main man. So we flew him in, especially for today. Coyote's here, guys. What's up, buddy? Hey, hey. How was your flight? No, it was excellent. Only a few hours to get down here. This is an epic looking boat. Permission to come aboard? Granted, come on. All right. Ugh. Are you excited to swim with these giant sharks? A little nervous, but also extremely excited. This is our first time getting to work with a predator of this size, specifically an ocean predator. So I'm ready to get in there with the tiger sharks. All right, well, we got your gear all set up out back. Let's go check it out. Okay, off we go. With the crew now complete and all aboard our home at sea, we set off for Tiger Beach. Some 20 miles offshore, our destiny awaited. And with it, the hungry teeth of tiger sharks. So how's it feel being the director? Uh, it's different. Uh, definitely, I used to take kind of the secondary role in the camera, but now I'm stepping up to direct. And uh, yeah, it's a learning process and I'm excited to see what's to come. Now, I think it's fair to say 
that this expedition was unlike anything we've ever done before. Not only was it a new challenge, it was a new danger as well. And to be honest, it was the first time I've ever experienced true fear prior to one of our trips. Oh boy. Now I know that might seem odd, since I filmed everything from grizzly bears and wolverines to the world's deadliest spider. But I won't lie, I was nervous. I know the majority of my fear stemmed from my inexperience with sharks. But let's face it, these are sharks, big sharks, with razor sharp teeth. So it goes without saying, expert guidance would be essential. And as luck would have it, Jonathan Bird and his team of Blue World Divers were available to join the trip. Jonathan and his crew have over 20 years of underwater filmmaking experience. In his Emmy Award winning program, Jonathan Bird's Blue World is in its sixth season. Let's just say these guys know what they're doing, and they had some critical advice for us shark diving rookies. All right, guys, well, we have our gear on and the boat is completely surrounded by sharks right now. We wouldn't be doing this if we weren't with an expert. And today we have Jonathan Bird from Jonathan Bird's Blue World here to teach us what we're doing and keep us safe. Is this safe? It's safe. Okay. Yeah, they're not aggressive towards divers. The only thing you want to do is just try to not be prey mm. by not acting like prey. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to wear gloves and a hood so you don't have any skin showing. They won't think that looks like fish. You know? Okay. And then when you hit the water, you want to get straight to the bottom. You don't want to flounder around like you might be something flopping on the surface that they might want to eat. So you just want to get to the sand and then once you're down there, they're going to treat you just like they treat everything else in the ocean. You're just another creature there. Okay, so don't flap and splash around on the surface. No. Trying to grab not. my camera. Just go just down. Just grab your camera, boom, right to the bottom. Okay, did you hear that, guys? We're going in. Coyote, are you ready? About as ready as I'm going to be. Let's get in there with those sharks. In addition to Jonathan's mentorship on dive techniques and camera operation, his keen sense of shark behavior would be crucial in assuring our safety underwater. After going through and prepping our dive gear, we had a final safety briefing with the crew of the ship. A serious shark bite this far at sea, even with the fastest life flights, would almost certainly be fatal. This fact was not meant to scare us, but was a stern reminder that strictly following shark protocol was an absolute must. The moments between the safety briefing and preparing to dive are hazy in my mind even to this day, as the reality of getting in the water with sharks became very real, very quickly. Well, we've done all the intro shots. We're suited up and we're actually about ready to get in there with the sharks. I'm looking over the surface, check this out. Guys, there's a lot of big sharks down there. It's one thing to talk about getting into the water with these top predators, it's another thing to actually do it. So I'm a little, on edge, I'd say, and I know it's going to be cool, but there is that moment of actually jumping off the boat that I've been kind of dreading, and uh, yeah, I guess it's my time. Let's go and get in the water with those giant sharks. Here we go. The water was now thick with chum, and the stench of decaying fish filled the air. My heart was pounding as countless sharks circled our perimeter, and time seemed to slow down. The sight below drove fear into even the bravest among us. We all made our way to the platform, hoping to find a shred of comfort in our pre-dive routine. But nothing could distract us from the obvious. Getting in the water was inevitable. And that moment was now. One by one, Jonathan and his crew descended below, each plunge drawing us closer to the edge. Then Coyote gave me one final glance and off he went. I stood motionless as I watched him disappear beneath the surface. Mario, I'm usually really confident about everything we do, but today, man, I hope we didn't bite up more than you could chew. Regardless, I got your back. Got your back too, man. Let's right. do it. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. By this point, the chum had drawn in hordes of lemon sharks. And maybe it was just me, but they seemed to be getting bigger and bigger right before my very eyes. Well, with every shark dive comes the moment where you actually have to dive in with the sharks. That moment is right now. Oh boy. Then just like that, my destiny with the sharks had arrived. Being in their presence was exhilarating, 
the recipe of danger, tranquility, mixed with a dash of adrenaline, resulted in a truly life-changing experience. With a few moments left before pulling anchor, I decided to fly our drone. Is that what I think it is? You gotta see this, come check this out. That's a hammerhead. That's for sure a hammerhead we're looking at. Mario, go tell the captain we need another dive. The entire boat lit up with excitement as we all raced to reassemble our dive gear. This was it. This is the moment we'd been waiting for. And it's a good thing fellow diver Jonathan Bird came along with us. His years of experience kept us all locked in on the task at hand, which was not only to get our cameras in front of that hammerhead, but was to put our safety always first. Remember, there were still hordes of sharks surrounding the boat, but this dive was different. This was not our first shark dive. And it was all about the hammerhead. One thing that's like really cool about scuba diving, guys, is like every time you're about to go in, you kind of get butterflies. You kind of get uh, tingly and excited and you can't wait to get in. Let's do this. Let's go. You ready? <laughs> Without hesitation, we all jump back into the water. First Jonathan, then Mario, and then, yep, there I am. Once again, we drifted through countless lemon sharks and made our way back to the white sands of Tiger Beach. At this point, the tiger sharks that greeted us upon landing almost seemed like old friends. Well, three hour old friends that is, but hey, once you do a barrel roll to escape the path of a charging shark, I think that definitely makes you friends for life. But as strange as it may seem, the circling tigers almost vanished. Well, almost. Still had to keep a watchful eye on them, but the other sharks? Well, they might as well have all been guppies. Everyone in our crew wanted to see one thing and one thing only, the hammerhead. Yet, it was nowhere to be seen. I started to think, was that really the shadow of a hammerhead? Maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me. Will I forever be known as the diver that cried hammerhead? But then, it happened. Suddenly, the sand grew dark, almost like the long shadow of a thunderstorm rolling in from some far off place. We all looked up and there, the perfect silhouette of a great hammerhead shark. It glided across the sun like some kind of aquatic phoenix. But then it turned and it dove straight for me. I froze as it plummeted by. Wow, that was close. Man, the speed of that 15 foot shark was so incredible that I decided right then and there I would be blinking a whole lot less for the rest of the dive. Of the nine species of identified hammerheads on Earth, the great hammerhead is by far the largest. Some individuals have been known to exceed lengths of 20 feet and weigh well over 1,000 pounds. Of course, more impressive than their sheer size has got to be the shape of that head. Just look at it. Perfectly designed to increase the surface area of their face to fit more electro-sensing ampullae of Lorenzini that help them detect their prey. This makes hammerheads quite the formidable food detectives, able to sense a stealthy stingray hiding beneath the sand. Just seeing this shark at Tiger Beach was an absolute stroke of luck, as great hammerheads are not common at this location. But today was our lucky day. Well, as long as we made it back to the boat, that is. Now compared to the tigers, this hammerhead was downright ornery. Between the multiple dive bombs at our cameras, to knocking down our dive master Houston flat on his butt. It had no shortage of tricks to keep us on our toes. It was fast, vigorous, and you know, I think its antics even had an effect on the tiger sharks. Check that out. Where was that in the last video? 
Of all my expectations of coming on this trip, seeing giant sharks do tricks was not one of them. But hey, it sure was cool. That was intense. Now it's time to swim with some giant water pups. Seeing the first manatee of the day was thrilling. With all the news of their disappearance, I was nervous we might have come all this way without being welcomed back. If nothing else, manatee are highly intelligent. And just like their closest living relative, the elephant, it's said they never forget. One by one, they started to swim closer and eventually began to encircle me while slowly pushing our group beyond the murky channel. And since park rangers had officially opened the spring for swimming, we carefully proceeded down a narrow and rocky passage, careful to keep our distance from any passing manatee. There was a swift current we all swam against, but I was sure this is where they must have come from. The murky water eventually gave way to a crystal clear expanse, and it became obvious I had found a manatee paradise. The freshwater springs of Florida are a manatee's favorite sanctuary for a reason. The springs stay a warm 72 degrees year round and serve as an oasis during winter months as manatee lack the body fat of other marine mammals, making them susceptible to cold snaps. I know it's hard to believe, but trust me, they get chilled easily. Although manatee can grow up to 10 foot long and weigh 1200 pounds, they are a fragile indicator species. They do not tolerate pollution or changing climate well at all. In just the last two years, it is sadly reported that we have lost 25% of all Florida manatee. As I swam further into the manatee spring, they began to approach in great numbers. One by one, they would appear and then swim off again, almost to test and see if we were there for the right reasons. When you're in the water with them, there are ground rules, including respecting restricted areas, no feeding, and the biggest of all, which is no grabbing or chasing a manatee. You should always watch from a respectful distance. If they want to approach you, trust me, they will. Manatees are naturally curious and very gentle, but they are also enormous and not nearly as slow as they might seem. If they're around you, it's because they choose to be. If they want to leave, they can in the blink of an eye. Manatees are very social creatures, and when they want to make contact, it's abundantly clear they're choosing you. Almost like a friendly golden retriever, they will nudge you and extend their flipper to connect with their new human friend. This typically lasts for only a moment or two, then they're off again. However, what you're about to see is the most amazing manatee encounter I have ever experienced. Manatee have a unique language and can speak to each other, so it's easy to hear when they get excited. I don't know what this one was saying to the rest, but whatever it was, certainly had them more curious. So much so, I was essentially swarmed. Seeing this many manatee in one place was a rare and amazing sight. There must have been over 100 of them. Their eyes would follow mine and their connection to me was clear. Every time one would leave, another would approach looking for the same attention. And it was easy to get lost in the awe of their playful behavior. After about 30 minutes, I had truly lost count of how many manatee had approached the camera. And compared to my previous experiences, I knew that this one was special. And sadly, perhaps the last time I would ever see so many in a single place. I could have stayed in the spring forever, but as light started to fade, it was time to make our way back to the kayaks. And for some of us, it was easier than others. 
We kayak through what seemed like a desert where seagrass once thrived, only to witness manatees struggling to feed on what little grass remained. Manatees need to eat up to 150 pounds of vegetation each day. And without thriving seagrass, we witness mothers and calves heading back out to the frigid sea to find more food. And that should not be happening this time of year. The loss of seagrass is a big factor to why so many manatee are dying. But there are also more established threats, including pollution and changing weather patterns. Each year, many manatee are struck by boats. And unfortunately, a lot of them do not survive. It is truly heartbreaking to see pieces missing from their tails and large scars covering their entire bodies. It's also a reminder that we need to do a better job to look out for these animals if we are to share their habitats for recreation. They are so special. And aside from our furry canine companions, the manatee are perhaps human's best friend, at least when we're in the water. Now let's head back on land to the East Coast where we're going to create our very own aquarium. These rocks are absolutely covered in snails. These are a very important part of this environment. It's worth getting a couple of these. Let's go ahead and put those in our bucket. First finds of the day. Tide pooling, in general, produces the most bizarre life forms that we can feature on the Brave Wilderness Channel. Oh yeah, here we go. We got some really good rocks to flip here. Ooh. Ha ha, got a crab trying to pinch me, but I have gloves on. Not today. Getting some really good stuff so far. Looks pretty good. Oh, that is a great sandworm. We will take a look at these here and let them go. And the reason these aren't real great for our tide pool aquarium is they really are subterranean. As soon as we put down some of the rocks and the sand in the aquarium, they're just gonna bury. So because of that, it's better to observe these creatures right here on the surface. But let's get a couple cool shots of these. These are very neat animals, very bizarre creatures. And these are aquatic worms, and they can swim. Whoa, creepy. There they go. Very interesting finds out here in the tide pool. Oh, right on my finger. That is actually a great find and is going to be a big part of the story when we build our tide pool aquarium later. I know it doesn't look like much, but believe me, when you learn more about the creature that I have in my hand, you are going to be super surprised. We're at that point where we're looking for the really difficult to find creatures. So I'm always looking for areas that just were recently covered with water as the tide is receding, uh, like this area right here, actually. Let's try this rock. Oh, boy. That was a heavy one. Nothing new there. All the same. Actually, wait a second. That is a new one. That is the species I was looking for. Yeah! Woo! Got another one. Great! That is perfect. You can let go now. There we go. All right, cool. Haha! -ha. Yes! We found quite a bit so far. Flipping rocks. I think it's time to get out the dip net and try another tactic. Uh, I like this pocket here. This pocket looks really good. See how there's this low overhang? That low overhang is great refuge for a lot of creatures that might be swimming in there. We want to do this fast. And just got a lot of snails on that one. Try to get underneath a little bit better. Oh yeah, there we go. Those are shrimp. Perfect. Look at that, that's a good one. We've got seven species so far, and I feel like that is pretty good. I think if we got one more for the day, we are ready to build our aquarium. Nope. Ha ha, I got it. That is exactly what we were looking for, folks. Okay, great, that is perfect. Okay, that's going to conclude the searching portion of today's tide pool adventure. Now, let's make it back to our base camp and set up shop. Whew, man, that was perfect. Oh man, I didn't think I was going to find that last one. Before we start introducing any of the creatures themselves, we need to sort of build up the environment. Let's make the habitat look 
like the tide pool environment that we just found these creatures in. So the first thing I'm going to do, because this is a rocky environment, is just get some of this coarse sand. This is pretty much the look of the environment, and we don't need a ton. And I think the first one that we're going to add also has an organism on it. This right here is a blue mussel, and these are the exact same mussels that you see served in restaurants. They're a big part of the marine sustainability out here in New England, these mussels actually attach themselves to rocks just like this using sticky strands called bisel. Bisel is what mussels use to affix themselves so they're not washed away by the tides and the crashing waves in this environment. I'm gonna put that down in there. So let's work our way smallest to biggest with all of these type of animals. I got a few shrimp, so let's put a few shrimp in there. We'll have a better chance to see them. There we go. A shrimp, which of course is a crustacean, feeds on small zooplankton and other animals, is definitely part of the cleanup crew here in the tide pool environment, but they're really cool looking. They've got a almost a zebra stripe to them, blue claws, and almost transparent. You can see all of the insides, much like a glass frog. I can see everything going on in there. Very cool addition to today's tide pool aquarium. Now, these are none other than our favorite little friends, the hermit crab. And hermit crabs are crustaceans that use snail shells that are now vacant to call their homes. And they actually look a lot more like a lobster than they do a crab. They have a long hooked tail that helps them wedge their way into the shell and stay tucked in. But as you'll see very soon, they'll start crawling around on the bottom of the tank. In my left hand, I have what is called a periwinkle. And a periwinkle is a very common snail species here in New England and in these tide pools. And in my right hand, I have what is called a dog winkle or a dog whelk. And believe it or not, the periwinkle on my left hand is the favorite food of the dog whelk that's in my right hand. And I have to say these dog whelks are voracious predators. They will affix themselves to a bivalve like a clam and then they will use their spiralized tongue to drill into the shell just like that and they will slurp out their meal over a long period of time. It's pretty crazy if you ask me. Here we go. Time for the all-stars of today's tide pool aquarium. We have not one, not two, but three species of crab. This is a first. The smallest crab is an Asian shore crab. It's got really sharp claws, and then of course, two decent sized pinchers right there. Now this is one of the invasive crab species here in New England. They obviously called the Asian shore crab, come from Asia, and uh, you can identify them because they have three spines to the right and the left of each eye. Even though it's invasive, these Asian shore crabs are certainly, ah, he's pinching me, established at this point in time. So it will make a great representative of today's tide pool aquarium. Look at that, right in front of the rock for the camera. All right, time for the second species of crab for the day. This fuzzy little crab is none other than the Jonah crab. And this is a native crab, and you can tell because it doesn't have three or five spikes next to the eye. In fact, if we can macro in there past the fuzz, you would see that it has nine spikes on each side of the eye, three in the middle. The three I can actually see right there in the middle. But this Jonah crab, is supposed to be here. Very cool. Okay, welcome to the Tide Pool Aquarium. You make a great addition. What we have next is none other than the voracious predator of the tide pools, the green crab. Look at that crab. And this is an absolutely beautiful one. They come in a few different color morphs. This one is green and it has purple claws, purple tip claws. And I can tell it's a green crab, whoa, because it's very feisty, number one. Definitely, ah, it's pitching me oh, on both sides. Okay, okay, I'm not wearing the gloves anymore, so it definitely hurts when you get pinched. Ah, these crabs prey um, upon mollusks and the other food species that the Jonah crab that we just saw relies upon. So they are an invader and a threat to this environment. Unfortunately, they have taken hold because they've been here for over a hundred years. And the reason I got two green crabs today was not to get pinched more, which is 
undoubtedly going to happen whenever you hold two crabs, you often always get pinched. So we have both a male and female green crab. So the way I could tell the difference uh, between a male and a female crab is by looking at the apron. The narrow apron is the male, the wider apron is the female. They do get a lot bigger than this. Green crabs can actually grow up to four inches from side to side on their carapace. Of course, that's the top of the crab shell. And they can actually stay out of water for nearly eight hours at a time, uh, which is a lot more than the other crab species here, making them a very invasive and robust predator of this tide pool. To cap off today's adventure, let's put them in there. Let's now add a few embellishments. We've got some bladder rack seaweed, a very cool plant that you'll find here in New England. The reason it's called bladder rack is because it has these little bladders of air that help it float to the surface when the tide moves in like it is right now, so that that way they can get closer to the surface to attract more light and they do need to photosynthesize to eat. A couple of really cool shells to just add the finishing touch. And there you have it. And the tide has returned. So I guess that's gonna be about it for today. Now we're gonna take a couple of photos and then release all of these creatures right back where we found them. Man, tide pools are so cool. But let's continue down the beach to see what we can find buried beneath the sand. The creature after is right below the surface in front of us. Now, the reason I know this is because of those. See all those little holes it's called a clamshell. And it's basically a telltale sign that if there's a hole in the surface of the sand, it's showing that there's a clam that lives just below the surface. So first things first, let me get set up, get all the cameras situated, and then I'll put on some gloves. We'll start digging. And I'm gonna show you some pretty cool things about some clams you've probably never seen before. Here we go, the clams we've been searching for today that we've traveled miles to find are just a few inches below the surface. Now, there's no way to find these clams without getting a little bit dirty, so we're just gonna embrace it. I'm using gloves because I'm worried about getting sliced by all the shells and fragments that are in the soil. You can see some of the clam shows here. There's probably dozens of clams down in the soil. All right, here we go gonna dig in. Now you wanna dig carefully. They're called soft shell clams for a reason. These clams have a very brittle shell. And if you're not careful, you can crack them quite easily. And what I'm feeling for are the ridges of the side of the clam because these clams are vertical in the soil, meaning they lay on their side, um, not flat, like the hard shell clams. I got one, okay. First clam of the day, this is exciting. All right, I'm just gonna move this back. Here we go, I'm gonna wiggle it out. Oh, there it is. Our first soft shell clam. Look at that one. Oh, it's squirting everywhere. They actually are called squirting clams or spraying clams because they do squirt water out just like that. But that's a really good one to look at. We're gonna put that off to the side. Oh, okay, got another one. Let me uh, show you what I found. I'm gonna get the other camera. So if you can see down in there, that is the top ridge of a clam. And what I want to do is just take it out just like that. Check that out. That is a nice soft shell clam. Let's see if we can find one more. You can see here, that's why I'm wearing gloves. You have all these fragments of shells down in the soil. Let's see if we can find one more. Oh yeah, here we go. There we go. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I think that's going to do it for the finding of clams. We're gonna leave this open right now because we're gonna put all the clams back in, but I'm going to get out a container, fill it with some clear water, clean off these clams so we can take a super close look at why this is such a bizarre creature. So, all right, there we go. Let's first talk about the shell of these clams. Now these shells are very brittle. And like I said, when we were digging it up, we had to be super careful as to not crack the shell. If the shell is cracked, the clam can actually get sick and die. So we would not want that to happen. But these shells are actually made out of calcium carbonate produced by the organism itself from the things that it eats. It will build layer after layer of shell. It will grow up to a size of four inches in length. They are called bivalves because they have two shells and that's why it gets the name bi, meaning two. And this clam in particular is interesting because it cannot close all the way. A lot of uh, other mollusks and bivalves can actually close up in their shells all the way. So they're always looking kind of half open. Don't worry, they're not sick. That's exactly how they're supposed to be. 
You see that little nubbin? That is a siphon, and the siphon has two tubes, and believe it or not, this siphon can stick up to the surface eight to 12 inches. But right now, the clam is taking cover. It's very bright out, so it's gonna be as tucked in as it can. When the tide comes back in and this clam is back in the soil, it will shh, put that siphon all the way up to the surface. And that's what's making all these clam shows. That's what gave away the clam's location to us for this adventure. Now, what's cool about this siphon is it has two tubes, one for taking in water and one for expelling water. These clams are filter feeders, so when they're drawing in water through one side of the siphon, they're actually taking that water across their gills to absorb the oxygen, and then all the food that they're eating, which is that microscopic algae in the water, goes to their mouth and then it goes all the way through their digestive system. And these clams, believe it or not, can filter up to 50 liters of water a day. And for a little creature like that, that's pretty impressive. So pretty much all day long, when there's water covering where they live, they're like a vacuum cleaner, just drinking up and filtering that water. Pretty cool. Now, the other thing that I find particularly interesting about these clams is their life cycle. They don't start life right here in the soil. They actually start as planktonic larvae. So the male and female clams will spray their gametes and their eggs into the water column through their siphons, and they will float out to sea. Now, when those eggs hatch, for the first few weeks of life, these clams are actually free swimming organisms or larvae. And when they grow big enough and become heavy enough, they will actually sink to the bottom. They will affix themselves to grow even larger by using bisel, which is that spider web like strandy stuff. Now here's the really interesting part and the one that really impresses me. These clams know when they grow large enough, release that bisel and they will actually ride the tide back into the estuaries. And once they find the perfect spot with the right kind of soil, they will use their foot and they will dig down. And once they're there, they will spend their entire rest of their existence right in that place, which could be up to 12 years. And I think that life cycle has to be one of the most impressive things that I learned when researching this bivalve. And I'm happy that I finally got to share it with you here today and to show you these really cool and bizarre soft shell clams. Now, not every beach trip is full of fun and games. In fact, sometimes going to the beach can be a matter of life and death. We are on a sea turtle rescue mission. And right now there's a turtle on a beach about 15 miles north from here and needs our help. These sea turtles, when they end up beach, it's because they're distressed and they can no longer swim. And without programs like the one we're participating in, they would all certainly die. So needless to say, this sea turtle right now, its life depends on us. Just this past year alone, more than 850 sea turtles were rescued off the shores of Massachusetts, a number that has been sadly increasing. Endangered sea turtles like the Kemp's Ridley, Green, and Loggerhead are washing up on beaches due to cold stunning and the changing climate is only making matters worse. I think I see it. Yep, here's our turtle. A volunteer was combing this beach and they discovered this Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And this is exactly what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to take the turtles off of the beach, away from the wind. And then you can see it was covered here with this bit of straw to protect it from exposure. And it does look like we are in time for this sea turtle to have a chance because you can see it still has a little bit of strength in its neck, just enough to pick up its head. And that is a very good sign because most of the turtles that you find that are cold sun cannot move whatsoever. So let's bundle this little turtle up and take it to the Wellfleet Sanctuary where it will start its process of rehabilitation and hopeful re-release back into the wild. Rapidly fluctuating sea temperatures due to climate change are narrowing the window for these turtles to safely migrate south each year. Rising sea temperatures are holding the turtles in northern waters for too long, and any sudden drop in water temperature below 50 degrees results in a mass cold stunning event for these marine reptiles. They have to be super quiet because these turtles are already really stressed, and loud noises have been proven to stress them even further. Oh, poor little, poor little turtle. We did notice that it had a bit of a response when we picked it up off the beach. Like it, it had some yeah. ability to raise its head. So that's pretty rare, honestly. A lot of the time these turtles are barely moving at all. Sometimes we'll think a turtle's dead and we'll leave it overnight to assess in the morning to make sure that it's still alive. Yeah. Cool. Um, is this our turtle? This is our turtle. All right. <laughs> How do we know that this turtle isn't dead? So when we first bring it onto this processing table, we will check to see if its flippers are in rigor. Rigor is short for rigor mortis. When an animal dies, 
it starts to seize up and all of its joints and body parts become stiff. So old. There was slight movement right there. Saw that. Yep, we'll kind of gently tug on their back flippers and then we'll touch their eye for a small eye response as well. And then what we'll do is we will actually use this pit tag scanner here because sometimes these turtles wash in and they have been tagged and no tag was detected here. Then the next thing we'll do is we will take measurements of its carapace. We will look to see if there are any um, injuries on the turtle anywhere, sometimes from pecking from seagulls if they've been sitting on the beach for a while. Um, and then they'll sometimes have some wounds on their carapace. And, and that's why it's so important to get these turtles off the beach yes. as quickly as possible. Each animal receives a number upon entry to the Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. And of the four sea turtles we assisted in rescuing, number 569 was the first to be sent for urgent care. You're on your way, bud. So we quickly mobilized and followed it to the New England Aquarium's Sea Turtle Hospital. Look at all these turtles. Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. Let's go, guys. All right, here we are at the Sea Turtle Hospital. Let's go inside to see our Kemp's Ridley start its rehabilitation process. Come on this way. All right, how's it going, Adam? Thanks Good. for having us. Thank you for coming. So are these our turtles? Is the, that? These are yeah. our turtles, and you have 569, and the Kemp's are very similar looking. And as you'll see, there's a lots of turtles everywhere. And then once they get into the water, they look even more similar. So we'll bring them up, we'll put a number on their shell, and we put a band around their flipper. So that way when we're looking for certain turtles, especially when they're in the water, they'll be easier to find. Awesome. Now we're gonna try to listen to see what the heart rate sounds like. Oh, cool. And their metabolism at this rate is very slow. Extremely slow. And that's slow. why you need these special instruments to be able to read that. We're listening for the turtle's heartbeat. So far, I just hear static. Oh, I think I just heard a whoosh. So this, this turtle is significantly lower heart rate than it's going to be when it leaves. Exactly, okay. yeah. So with that, we will give it a dose of epinephrine that will help get that heart rate a little bit up there and a little bit more prepped for a swim. So this is like the jump start for the rehabilitation process here at the hospital. Once a sea turtle receives epinephrine, it is then placed in a small pool of water for observation. Also called a swim test, this is where the clinical team will look for signs of other damage and possible infections. Let's see how 569 does. So that's a great sign, obviously, that nice little breath there. And turtle's going into the water. And so, yeah, I mean, he's ready to go. That. For these turtles, freshwater is important because of the dehydration piece. Mm. Helps rehydrate them. One or two days in that fresh water won't be detrimental, and then they're into the full salt water tanks. These turtles have been out there breathing in cold air, water, so we see a lot of pneumonia. So you can kind of see it's slowing down a little bit there. Okay. We also Buddy. see how high in the water he is, so he's, he's definitely got some gas in his system there that's keeping him very floaty. As you can see, and he has some odd coloration in those front flippers, so he may have some skin issues that over the next few days as he warms up, might become a little bit more prevalent. So I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Adam, but in your professional experience, how would you say our turtle here, number 569, is looking in terms of its potential for rehabilitation? Yeah, no, the prognosis for this turtle at this point would be good. I saw some bubbles coming out of the, okay. the ears, the nose. Then you saw him lift his head and took a nice breath. So that's all great things. Love it. That is so great to hear. And it's so nice to see the turtle lively again. I feel like most people who would encounter one of these cold stun turtles on the beach might even think they were already dead. But sure enough, here at the hospital, after a little shot of epinephrine and a chance to swim, we've got a lot of movement. All right, so now that our turtle has swam for the first time at the hospital, part of the rehabilitation process of warming them back up to the appropriate temperature, which is about 72 degrees, takes a few days. After treating nearly 5,000 turtles, this facility has learned quite a bit about how to bring the temperature back up in the appropriate way. And the best way they found to do it is a stage process over days using multiple tanks. Over the next two days, they will actually be placed in the saltwater baths that will raise them up to about 65 degrees and then eventually up to the 72 degrees that you'll see here in the holding tanks. These turtles here, they're already being raised up to temperature. Pretty cool and definitely something that really helps these turtles stand a chance of being re-released. Along with being critically endangered, the Kemp's Ridley is also the rarest sea turtle on the planet. Once abundant, their population suffered a massive crash in the 1980s, where as few as 250 nesting females were estimated to remain. 
Luckily for the world's smallest and rarest sea turtle, large-scale conservation efforts help restore their population to stability by the mid-2000s. However, with current climate trends being as they are, the pressure is now back on to save this species from extinction. I've heard reports that the Kemp's Ridley are somewhere in the population of 30 to 40,000 individuals in the world. Is that is that what you've heard also? They are a critically endangered population. So, I mean, the fact that you're seeing thousands of turtles come to the facility, this is a, a significant mass yes. of this species. You know, getting these guys through and back into the ocean is critical. Well, this is not the end of the road for the video, guys. We actually have one more step that we want to show you as part of this turtle rehabilitation program. This one, though, is going to take us on a short trip to the airport. So as you can see, we are no longer in the Sea Turtle Hospital. We are in an air hangar because there's an amazing volunteer program called Turtles Fly 2 that takes these sea turtles down to warmer waters in the southern United States where they will finish their rehabilitation and be released back into the wild much sooner than Mother Nature would allow here in New England. And we just got word that the turtles arrived, so it's time to get to work and load up these sea turtles. All right, so you have a van load and a truck load full of sea turtles that are being loaded up by volunteers and aquarium staff onto this aircraft right now. They are trying to set a record today by loading 100 sea turtles onto this airplane. That's a lot of reptiles. So right now the pilot and the co-pilot are up there playing a little bit of turtle Tetris to try to get all of these animals loaded up onto this aircraft. It takes a lot of resources to fly these turtles, so they want to make sure every flight is efficient and as productive as they can. Trying to get one more up there? Yeah, I think they have a little shirt of banana box. Okay. Nice. Oh, there's more turtles. <laughs> there's always more turtles. <laughs> Last one. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. Got the, uh, the final turtle box to load into the aircraft. Last one. Something I never thought I would say. Turtles on an airplane. But here in New England, it happens about a dozen times a year. That's cool. The turtles that make the flight to Florida are the ones ready to be released back into the wild. But others needing more long-term rehabilitation, like our friend 569, will continue to receive care at the Sea Turtle Hospital until they are ready to be released when spring returns to New England. Researchers have predicted that by 2031, just eight years from this video's release, thousands of cold stunned sea turtles will wash up on New England shores every single year. It takes an amazing collaboration to combat these events and return healthy sea turtles into the ocean to rejoin their populations. From emergency veterinarians, to airplane pilots, to hundreds of beachcombing volunteers, I was so proud to play a small part in saving these rare and endangered animals. But the work continues every single day from the cold shores of Cape Cod to the warm waters of South Florida. And these wildlife heroes need our support. Please join Brave Wilderness in the New England Aquarium by clicking the link in the description to donate, spread awareness, or perhaps volunteer yourself in the effort to save these beloved treasures of our oceans.